If you have a gift tonight, you can put it in the box in the back when you leave. Uh, just give to the Lord in that way or put it on the altar however you will. We're not going to pass the basket tonight. But just put it in the box or on the altar before you leave anytime this evening. That would be great. Um, we don't beat you up about giving. And by God's grace, we never will. We're not putting you under type bondage uh, to any type of law. Um, but in the family, are we all family? Yes, sir. Uh, there are certain responsibilities that we have in a family. And uh, I'm not pulling teeth, but under grace, we're honest with each other. Okay? So I'm going to be honest. Giving has been down over the last two months. Uh, significantly over the last several weeks. Uh, some of you, if you're giving online, great, that catches up uh, with us. But here's what uh, is on my heart, is that you're hearing grace preached and you're not being beat up under it, but I'm going to guarantee you the Holy Spirit will tell you to give. Okay? So you can't sit back and say, well, the Lord didn't tell me to give. That's not Jesus. That's not the Lord. Because He's a giver. And we are made in His likeness and in His image. And so we are givers because He's a giver. Amen. Children are dismissed to go with Miss Michaela downstairs. And, uh, any other one? Okay, yeah. Are you going? Okay. Good. No, ma'am. The age limit is five. I mean, starts at five and you're not quite there yet. <laughs> I can joke with Kathy like that because she jokes with me. Lisa and I got a wonderful time of rest, and she was sending me a message telling me she was watching us. <laughs> it was a quick trip, and it was a wonderful time. We truly, truly enjoyed it, and uh, it was a restful time. And some of uh, you asked us to bring Russ and Don Jones back, but I probably would be like them and wouldn't leave Florida either. <laughs> it's beautiful uh, down there, but uh, Lisa got to go to her first Major League Baseball game and watch the Yankees get spanked by the Tampa Rays. I, she said, do you like Tampa Bay? And I said, no, I just don't like the Yankees. <laughs> but she's a Yankees fan. But uh, I don't like the Yankees. <laughs> yeah, the house divided. Uh, we turned the air back down, but we are having some problems. And Pat O'Neill is out working on our units now trying to get some things fixed for us. It would be the hottest day of the year so far that the air's not working. But uh, thus, again, one more thing that we need you just to obey God. That's all we want you to do when it comes to giving. You just obey God. You don't have to do anything other than that, okay? And you'll never get any pressure from us, and we're not going to take any pressure from you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's turn to Genesis, the 37th chapter. We left off... Last week, talking about um, Jacob and Leah and Rachel and the sons that they had and the multiple wives that he had and <laughs> Belha and Zelpha and um, their secondary wives, according to the Amplified <laughs> version, is what uh, it said. And we established that most of us can't handle one as men, so why do we want two, right, Brian? <laughs> And so, <laughs> yes, ma'am, that's true. You're right. But tonight we're going to, if you've been to Sunday school at all growing up, uh, you've probably heard uh, the story of Joseph and his coat. I mean, that's a classic Sunday school message that they teach and they bring out the bathrobe with all the different colors on it. At least we did when I was growing up. Or the flannel graph. You remember the flannel graph? Carol, what grade did you teach when I was in Sunday school? Kindergartner first. Yeah, Carol taught. <sighs> she was only 10 when she was teaching, but I was younger. But we're going to share that uh, portion of Scripture tonight. We're going to start with verse 3 of chapter 37 of Genesis. Uh, if you look at verse 2, it says these are the generations of Jacob. Um, Jake, Joseph being 17 years old. So now we've established that Jacob's son, Joseph, who was born of which wife? Rachel. The one whom he loved. Um, 
So he's 17 years old. Verse 3. Now Israel. Uh, we skipped over some chapters. And when it says Israel here, it's talking about Jacob. Because Jacob has wrestled with God. And God changed his name to Israel. Uh, it's always a good thing to have your name changed. That was great. You look through Scripture, every time Jesus, anybody encountered Jesus, he changed their name. And it was always for the better. Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all of his children. Note something right there. It doesn't say that he didn't love his other children. Okay? I've heard this preached sometimes, and they'll say, well, Joseph, or Jacob hated all of his other children. No, it didn't. The Bible doesn't say that. He just loved Joseph more. If you were one of my children, especially around their grandpa, their papa, they try to always figure out who's the favorite. Am I the favorite? They're sending texts. Natalie would wait up till 12.01 and be the first one to text happy birthday to him so she could get points and say next Sunday, I'm the favorite. Turn this gain down just a little bit on this mic, please. It's got a little ring up here. Thanks. But it doesn't say that Joseph or Jacob didn't love his other children. He just loved Joseph more, um, more than all of his other children. And he made him a coat or a robe of many colors. Now, we, we talk a lot about um, the definitions of words in their original language. Because if we don't, then we get so far out of context uh, that a lot of scriptures have become something to the church that aren't really in scripture. We preach a certain doctrine or we'll take things down a certain road and they've gotten the definition for their word from the Webster's Dictionary and it doesn't mean anything like what their original word meant. <clears throat> so if you look at verse number 3 of Genesis 37, you will see Israel loved Joseph more than all of his other children because he was the son of his old age. Now, he had another son as well in his old age. Benjamin. Most scholars would believe that Benjamin at this time, Joseph being 17, Benjamin was about four years old. So he had another son even in his older age, so that's not really what the Scripture means, the son of his old age. It's really what the Scripture says in the Hebrew is here, it's the son of the woman he loved in his old age. Because Rachel's womb had been bound up and blocked and she wasn't able to bear children. And then God looked upon Rachel and blessed Rachel and opened up her womb in their old age. So it's really the correct interpretation here. He loved Joseph more than all the others because he loved Rachel. And he's the firstborn with Rachel. So he loved all of his other children with uh, Leah and Zelpa and Belha. Help him, Jesus. But he loved Joseph more. Not just because he had him when he was old, but because he was born of the woman that he loved in his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. There is, if you'll circle the word colors in your Bible or underline it, make a special note, there is no Hebrew word to match this word color here. There's uncertainty amongst the scholars and the writers who've interpreted and translated this and so there's some, uh, not really a, a word that we can just pick out and say, you know, here, here's the word in Hebrew, and so that's what it means. It, it's, it's not really there. It's uncertain. But from all the years, I'm going to do a teaching here soon that's going to help us. Because we look at the Hebrew, which is the original language, and then for the first time, at, many years after that, it was translated into Latin. The Catholics were the first ones that took the original Hebrew and Greek, and they translated it into Latin, the Vulgate. Okay, uh, So we have some Catholicism that bled into the interpretation, and they did the best that they could with the language that they had to interpret these words. But then there were many, many people who were called copyists. And what they did is they copied the Scriptures. Monks did it a lot. They would take the Scripture... They weren't translating it. They weren't rewriting it. They were copying it. How do you think we got the Word of God from place to place without the printing press? They copied it. So, I'm sorry? They were scribes, exactly. 
That's what the Bible would call scribes. Even in the Old Testament, we see that the Pharisees and the scribes. Well, the scribes, all they did was take the original Hebrew and they were recopying it. So the synagogue in Bethlehem had a copy. The synagogue in Bethany had a copy. The synagogue in Jerusalem had a So they were copious. And they had it even in the early church, even into the early centuries when the Catholics had uh, translated it into Latin. But when it got translated, it lost some of its meaning. They didn't translate it into exact words. So we come up now, we're in King James 1611, and you have this word colors, and there's really no Hebrew word to go back to to the root of it. But what it, this is what they've come up with, down through the history and the culture of trying to get back to the original language. This robe or coat here is really a tunic. It's a long garment with sleeves down to the palms. Now, most of your robes wouldn't be long sleeves. They would be three-quarter probably length or half, and they would have big openings for the air to flow through. But this was a tunic that went all the way to the palms, and it flowed all the way to the crest of the feet, right above the arch of your foot. So it basically is covering every inch of your body. It's a robe that was sewn together of patchwork of numerous patterns of color. Um, so you might have a blue patch, an orange patch, a green patch, a pink patch, a red patch. And they're just sewn together. Uh, worn by persons not given, now this is important, to manual labor. Could you imagine if this coat is... <laughs> uh, you all can mark this down. Pastor Wright is no longer allowed to use any head mic that we own. Every time he uses it, he breaks it. We bought a $600 one and he broke the headpiece of it. He used a new one we got that's working really, really well and he broke the clip off of it, so now you can't clip it on your belt. And the strength, the, the line on it's not long enough to put it in your pocket, so I put it on the night and my head's going... <laughs> I'm just giving him a hard time. Duct tape, that's right. So you've got a coat that's coming down past your palms. Can you imagine trying to do manual labor all day long? So that garment was not made for specific, it was specifically made for people who weren't involved in manual labor. Plus, it's down past his feet. He'd be tripping all over. He'd have to hike his skirt up to work. Are you listening? So this garment was given to people who were not into manual labor. What are you saying? <laughs> he didn't have to work for it. I'm sorry? Man, he gave it to management, yeah. Which is true. Israel gave this coat of what we call many colors. It's really a coat of favor. He gave it to him because he favored him over his other brothers. And the same word in Hebrew, Hadesh, is the same word for grace. Grace and favor are the same exact words in Hebrew. So wherever you see favor in the Old Testament, it's grace. So when he showed him favor, he's really showing him grace. So he really didn't give him a coat of many colors, he gave him a coat of grace. And even the coat itself signified and represented that he wasn't going to have to do manual labor. I was excited about it. It's a token of the father's love for the favored son. He gave him a coat because he's favored. It was a token of his love. Now listen. <laughs> he gave it to him as rights of a firstborn. Go to First Chronicles, the fifth chapter. First Chronicles, the fifth chapter, verse number one. Now the sons of Reuben, who was the firstborn by Leah, the very firstborn of Jacob, for he was the firstborn by force uh, so much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph. So what he gave this coat to 
Joseph because he loved him, but he also deferred upon him the rights of the firstborn that should have gone to Reuben. But because Reuben had defiled his father's wife and had laid with Belha, you remember Belha? Reuben slept with his stepmother, twice removed. And because of that, he forfeited his birthright. And because that's scripture. And because of that, this is another reason that Joseph got the coat, deferring on to him <laughs> the birthright of Jacob. So how do we get our coat of grace? Our robes of righteousness. It was deferred upon us, giving us the birthright that belonged to Jesus. We get everything that He got. And it's a robe of righteousness that we didn't have to work for. We don't earn it. We don't have to work for it. It's given to us. Why? Because the Father loved us. He favors us. <laughs> the Gill's exposi Exposition um, commentary says that the colors might represent the various graces of the Spirit of God implanted into Joseph. Dreamer, leader, organizer, these different, the different colors representing the different graces or gifts that God had given to Joseph and implanted in him. And the needlework on this garment represents the righteousness of God. That's what Gil's exposition says. Now, I said there wasn't a word in Hebrew for colors, but there is a word in Hebrew for coat. Here, see the word coat in verse 3? It's kathon, K-A-T-H-A-N, kathon. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 where it says that God covered Adam and Eve with the skins of an animal. He coated them. He put a covering over them of an animal sacrifice. Same word is used here, kathon, where it says he made a covering of grace and favor and gave it to his son. Anybody take that? I'll take it. <laughs> now, the Latin Vulgate first translated this word coat as a tunic polymita. Poly meaning many, mita meaning color. And that's why we have what we have in the King James coat of many colors. When it's really a coat or a tunic uh, given to the firstborn. I thought that was good. So why did Jacob or Israel love Joseph more than he loved his other brothers? He was a son born out of blessing. So the Bible says that he saw God saw Rachel and he blessed her and opened her womb. So he was a son born out of blessing. He's a son born from a woman that Jacob loved. He was a son that Jacob had always wanted. Why? Because he really didn't want Leah. He wanted Rachel. Joseph was given a coat of grace and we're given a coat of grace in favor. Verse 4. This coat of grace or favor... I'm going to refer to it as a, a, a coat of grace or a garment of grace. When his brother saw it on him, he wasn't very popular. Let me tell you something. When people see the grace and the favor of God upon you, not necessarily the world, most of the times it's the brothers and sisters in the family, the church, that gets stirred up the most about the favor that God's put on your life. God blesses you with a new car or a new house or you get a promotion at your job and you're wearing that favor around and I'm supposed to rejoice with you when you're rejoicing, not gossip. <laughs> and that's what happened. His brothers looked at that. says they hated him and they could not speak peaceably about him. Now, I don't know about you, but my mama said if you can't say nothing nice about somebody, don't say nothing at all. Were you all told that growing up? That's what my mom always said. Jamie, if you can't say something nice, then don't say something at all. Don't say anything at all. Then I will be quiet a lot of times in the church. But it's, that's what it says. His brothers, they hated him. 
verse 5 it says Joseph dreamed a dream it was not bad enough that they already hated him because of the coat that he had the grace the favor that was on his life but now he thinks he's some big shot and he's going to tell us about a dream that he's got that we're going to bow down to him and we're going to have you read the story you'll, you'll find it there they, he became increasingly unpopular <laughs> and more hated verse number 9 so not only did he have a first dream, but then he has a dream a second time. Another dream. Basically saying about the same thing, you're all going to bow down to me, I'm going to be better than you, I'm going to be popular. He wasn't gloating about that. He was 17. He was young and full of zeal, but not a lot of wisdom. Because not everything God shares with you are you supposed to share with everybody else because they can't accept it or handle it. You know, if God tells you, if he says, Joe, this is what I'm blessing you with, this is the gifts that I'm giving to you, it's not for Joe to stand up next Sunday morning and get TV cameras out and say, look, this is what I am and this is who I am. Joseph wasn't doing that because he was bragging or being brash about it. He was, he was excited that he had a dream. And he wanted to tell everybody his dream. Yeah, he was 17. Verse number 19, 17, verse number 17. Okay, let me back the story up here. So he's got a coat of favor. He's had two dreams. His older brothers are out in the field. They're keeping the watch over the dad's flocks. Because remember, we talked about it last week. When Jacob left Laban, he took the better sheep with him. He had all kinds of animals and flocks. So they're out watching the sheep, and he sends Joseph. He says, okay, you're old enough now. I'm going to send you out. You're going to go check on your brother's report back to me. So he goes out to the fields where they're supposed to be. They're not there. He finds a man and says, where are they? He says they're in Dothan. Dothan is 12 miles uh, west of Syria. Dothan is one of just a very few cities mentioned in the Old Testament that are still called the same thing today. Uh, it's called Tel Dathan in Syria. They put that word Tel in front of it, only means city. That's only the word Tel means city. So Tel Dathan is the city of Dathan. So today, you could go 12 miles west of Syria, the border of Syria, and you're going to find Dathan. It's still there today. It means two wells or two cisterns. That's what Dathan means. It was, Dathan was along the caravan route, the trade route, from Syria to Egypt. It's important. You know these things. So Joseph goes down and he finds his brothers, not in the field where they're supposed to be, but he finds them over in Dathan. Verse 19 says, They saw him coming, and when they saw him coming, they said, Oh brother, here comes that dreamer. I mean, it's what the Bible says. They were fed up with him, and he, they saw the coat. They could see it a mile away like neon flashing lights. Remember, anybody ever remember John Daly golfing in his plaid? <laughs> that's, that's what Joseph looked like coming down the trail and his brother said, here comes that dreamer. And they conspired amongst themselves to kill him. They wanted to kill Joseph. They were so sick of their brother. Now they wouldn't speak an ill word against him, but they wanted to kill him. The, that boy of favor, verse 24, they plotted because of what Reuben, or Judah, it was Judah, that spared him. They didn't kill him. They cast him into the pit. Now, I don't think that things are in Scripture accidentally. I don't think that God specifically points out that his brothers were in Dathan, city of two whales, to go and then say his brothers threw him in a pit. What his brothers really did is they threw him in one of those two wells that had dried up. So he was thrown in one of the two wells that there was no water found in anymore, so it wasn't existing for the purpose for which it had been created, so they throw their brother into one of the two wells. Huh? 
Nobody go to him to get it out. That's right, because if it had water in it, people would have been coming to it daily to draw the water out. They knew if they threw him in that pit, nobody was going to find him. But Reuben had it in his heart and went back to check on him. And it's amazing that it's Reuben, the one whose blessing Joseph got, that comes back to check on him. And they, they decide that they're going to spare him and they're going to sell him. So Joseph was sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites. And the Bible says, around verse 24, that he was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Again, I don't think it's by accident. Leviticus 27 verse 5 says that a male slave under the age of 20 was to be sold for 20 pieces of silver. What was the going wage for an adult slave? 30 pieces of silver, which our master was sold for. But Joseph was 17, so he's under 20. So the going rate for a male slave to be sold was 20 pieces of silver. So his brothers got 20 pieces of silver for him. Now, point number one, Joseph was protected from death. God's favor was on him, not just the favor of his father, but the Lord had his hand on him and had a purpose for him. He had given him a dream, and the dream wasn't to be thrown into a pit to die. There was going to be a fulfillment of that by the time we get to chapter 50. We'll see the fulfillment of the purpose for the dream that God had given him, and it wasn't to die in a pit, so God protected him from death. Do you know that when the favor of the Lord is on you, and even your brothers try to kill you or stop your dream, or to halt the favor of God in your life, or to try to keep you from getting to where God's got you to go? I used to say that you know man could block God's will in your life. I don't believe that anymore. Men have a choice, and it does have consequences on their choice, but if God has a purpose and a plan for you, and He's placed His favor on your life, and you believe in that, and you've placed your trust in that, He'll move heaven and earth to get you to that. And I believe that's what happened. He, he protected Joseph. We can look back through our lives now in retrospect, and we can say all the times that God protected us, spared us. We should have died here. We could have been in a car wreck there. We could have gotten... gotten snuffed out there but God protected us why because he had a plan and a purpose for you and you're on this earth for a purpose and a plan and you're fulfilling that right now so Reuben returns to the pit and Joseph's not there now watch this let me see here I'm going to show you this Okay, verse 29. I, I know. And Reuben returned unto the pit, and behold, Joseph was not in the pit. And he rent his clothes. You see this in Scripture a lot. And what, the word rent here, what, what it is, it's actually a Jewish, ancient Jewish custom called kira. K-E-R-I-A-H. K -E -R -I -A -H, K -E -R I-A-H. It's an ancient Jewish custom. It's the tearing of one's outer garment when a loved one has died. Commonly done in the temple. Commonly, not always, but commonly done in the temple. And the renting, the one that tears the garment, the tear is done vertically, starting at the top around the neck, and it's torn from top to bottom. exposing the heart area. Why? Because if you had a loved one to die, and you rent the clothes, and it's an ancient Jewish tradition, and you're renting from the top, starting around the neck, to the bottom in a vertical direction to expose the heart area. Why? Because that's where you grieve from. That's where the, 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 the grieving comes from, is from the heart. When Jesus said, it is finished and yielded up his spirit, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And once and for all, God removed the wall of hostility between man and himself by exposing his heart to creation. What was his heart? His heart was that there would be no barrier between him and us, that we could come boldly into him. And so when Reuben went back, Reuben was expressing, number one, he had to be concerned for his brother. Or he would have never returned to check on him. And he, expo he, he ex uh, extends even more 
uh, emotion in it by showing us that when his brother was not there, he assumed that he was dead and he rent his clothes, exposing his heart of grief, pointing us to say that when Christ died for us and the, the veil of the temple was rent top to bottom, in the temple where this was most commonly done, that he would expose his heart to all of creation. And this was done on the backdrop of the inconceivable act of love. The death of His Son Jesus. The heart of God is found within Jesus. Jesus is what God sang. Jesus be the sinner, we sang it. That's what God sang to us. He's always saying, the Holy Spirit has come pointing us to Jesus. You can't get to God unless you come through Jesus. It's all about Jesus. I've had some discussions recently with a, of a lot of different people from a diff, across denominational lines, and one thing that I hear constantly is these guys pounding on one another because, oh, that's false doctrine and all this. And I told a couple of them this week, I said, listen, if it comes down that they're teaching that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, that he died on the cross and shed his blood, that he was placed in a borrowed tomb and he rose three days later, he lived on the face of the planet for 40 days in his resurrected body, appearing to 500 at one time and different times to many others, and then he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he's ever living right now to intercede on our behalf to make sure we get the benefits of everything that he promised us in the kingdom, then I don't care what else you're preaching. Baptize backwards, frontwards, dunk three times, drink real wine, don't drink real wine, dip it in bread, don't have the bread with the wine. It doesn't matter. And I'm... Lord, help me, Jesus. But to, to get on Facebook or to get on social media or to stand... This is what just cooks my gourd is people get up and pulpits and name other pastors in the valley and start blasting them because they preach this or they don't believe that. And I'll say, have you had one conversation with that brother to understand what he believes or what he preaches? Have you listened to one message that he's preached? No, you're thinking just because he's not a part of my church or my denomination, he doesn't know what, he's not preaching the whole truth and nothing but the truth so help him God because he doesn't agree with me 100%. Man, there's going to be some shock folks. You mean they made it? <laughs> yep. Yep. They did. I'm just going to be glad I made it. Hey. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> That's true. Verse 34. Jacob now rents his clothes when Reuben returns and tells him that his son is dead. You know the story, they take his clothes, his garment, his garment of grace. Watch this. How in the world would Israel, Jacob, know that his son was dead by a coat? It was his identification. There was only one son that had a coat of many colors. So everyone could identify that that was Joseph. We have robes of righteousness. That's our identification. We are found lost and hidden in Christ. Our identity is in Him. What was the enemy trying to do? His enemies being religion, his brothers and sisters. They were trying to take the very thing away from him that was his identity. And that's a, this is very, very significant and important. I'm going to get to it tonight, Lord helping. So the first time that Joseph is found in any trouble, what's happening? His garment, his identification is being taken from him, taken back and used to say, look, your son's dead. What they did is they killed an animal and put the blood on that coat and took it back to their father. He wasn't dead. But he was identified by that coat. You know, that still today in forensics, they can tell by that garment, even if the whole garment wasn't there, if it was just a thread, they could have told whose garment it was. Verse 36. So Joseph has been protected from God, by God from death, thrown into a pit, and Joseph was sold to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and now the Ishmaelites or the Midianites, they were really the same people. They were descendants of Ishmael that lived in Midian. 
Ishmaelites and Midians. Some translations say Ishmaelites, some translations say Midianites, and people, scholars, will argue back and forth and say it's two groups of people. No, it wasn't. It was one group of people. They were descendants of Ishmael, and they lived in Midianite, um, in Midian, thus called the Midianites. So now he's sold into Potiphar's house. Potiphar, his name means dedicated to the sun god Ra. He was an officer in Pharaoh's civil police. Not the army, it was a part of the army, but it was more of a local civil state police type of organization that he was the head over in the government of Egypt. Chapter 39, Genesis, verse 2. So Joseph has been protected by the Lord. Verse 2, chapter 39. Underline this, mark this down in your Bible because it's said many different times from this place point forward in the Scripture, and the Lord was with Joseph. How many of you believe the Lord was with Joseph in the pit? How many of you believe because the Scripture says that the Lord was with Joseph in Potiphar's house? And what was the promise of the Lord to us? That He will never leave you nor forsake you. So I can guarantee you in your lowest pit, He's with you. If you're in a situation where people falsely accuse you like they did in Potiphar's house, guess what? The Lord is with you. So the Lord protected him. Now the Lord is going to prosper him. Why? Because the Lord was with him. Verse 4, it says, Joseph found grace and favor in Potiphar's eyes. And because he was protected and now he's been prosperous and everything that his hand touched was blessed, I have that same promise. You're blessed in the city, you're blessed in the country, you're blessed in your going, you're blessed in your coming. Blessings will overtake you, blessings will overshadow you. Everything that your hand touches will be blessed. And everything that the hand of Joseph touched because the Lord was with him and favored him was prosperous. And because he was prosperous, it made Potiphar prosperous. Prosperous, You know, because everything that your hand is touching, the businesses that you work for will be blessed because you're blessed. So now God promotes him. And this is not the work of Joseph. This is not because Joseph did anything special or had any gift or talent greater than anybody else. This is because the favor of the Lord has been on Joseph's life and his father recognized it and blessed him with a coat and now his heavenly father is continuing to bless him and everything that his hands touch. Joseph was godly and highly favored. Verse 12. Now the story goes that one day he's working in Potiphar's house and he's over everything in Potiphar's house. And one day all the other guys are gone. He's the only one there. He's doing his chores and Potiphar's wife, who had been trying to seduce him for months, the Bible says, trying to come after him, trying to pressure him. And he said, you know, you're married to my master. I'm not going to do that to my master. And he gets there one day, and she makes a pass at him, and he takes off. Runs right out of his clothes. Look at it. She caught him by his garment, his identification what he could be identified by, saying, lie with me, sleep with me, have sex with me, if we want to put it down in our vocabulary. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. So now for the second time, a garment is going to be used to lie about Joseph. Twice now, the enemy is trying to to cause him harm, stripping away his identity. Listen, folks, one thing I can tell you is that your robes of righteous can, righteousness cannot be stolen from you. <laughs> if the devil couldn't give them to you, he can't take them away from you. If you didn't work to earn them, then you can't unwork to unearn them. But see, if you do it by work, if I tell you you've got to do these ten things to get out of the evil prison that you're in, and now you're in the prison of God's favor and grace, a slave by love to Him, then if you do bad things, you get back in this prison over here. I didn't do anything to get out of this prison. It wasn't on my own merit. It wasn't any work that I did. It was the favor and grace of God that pulled me up out of the prison of sin and death. And now I'm a love slave to the Lord. And there's no bad thing that I can do that will get me out of that prison. And so the robes of righteousness that are by faith 
can't be stolen. The enemy can't come in and do what he was trying to do to Joseph by stealing his garments. Verse 20. Joseph is put, he's falsely accused. He's put in prison based on a lie. You know everything that the enemy says about you is a lie. Everything he says to you and about you is a lie. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's lying to you and about you and the lies that he's telling about you and to you are to do nothing but imprison you. Verse 21, somebody say, but the Lord. But the Lord was with Joseph and the Lord is with you. And so when the liar, the falsely accuser of the brethren comes to you and tries to lie to you, all you have to say is, the Lord is with me. My big brother is standing behind me and you can't bully me. And because the Lord was with him, he showed him mercy and he gave him favor and grace in the sight of the prison keeper. So once again, he's protected from death, he's prosperous and he's promoted. Why? Because the Lord is with him. Somebody say, the Lord's with me. Genesis chapter 40. He has a gift. I think that his father saw that in him, and that's another reason he gave him that coat. Remember, Gill's expo exposition said that those patches of different colors could have been representations of the graces or the gifts, kairos, kairos, not kairos, kairos, which means grace gifts that his father saw in him. So he was an interpreter of dreams. You got the baker and the butler. They both have dreams. Joseph interprets them. The baker gets his head cut off as Joseph interpreted his dream. And the butler gets restored to his position. He said, remember me when you get to Pharaoh's house. Chapter 41, verse number 9. Chapter 41, verse number 9. Pharaoh has a couple of dreams. Nobody in the kingdom can interpret his dreams, and the butler remembers, oh, wait, there's a guy down there in prison, a Hebrew boy, and he interprets dreams. And they summons him. Say, go get him. I do remember my faults this day. He forgot him. That was his fault. He had forgotten Joseph, and he told Joseph that he had remembered him. What do butlers do? Open doors and close doors. I so said, he's about to open a door for Joseph. They fetch garments. That's right. And what does Joseph do? It says he shaved himself, he cleaned himself up, and he put on new raiments of clothing. So he put on a... He knew that he wasn't going to be presentable to the king in his prison suit, so he changed his clothes. Again, a garment. And he goes to Potiphar... Verses 40 through 45, Joseph is promoted to the second over all of Egypt. Now, we can go into Potiphar's or to Pharaoh's dreams, seven years of bad, of good soil, store it all up, stock it all up, keep all the crops you can because there's seven years of famine coming. And Joseph interprets that dream, so Joseph, uh, Pharaoh says, you're the wisest man in all of Egypt. So he promotes him to second over all of Egypt. Watch this, verses 40 through 45. He gave him his ring. Sounds like another story in Scripture where the son's ring was restored. To him. What is that? That's his finances. He gave him the power to all of his wealth. Without asking any questions of anybody else, you have all the wealth of Egypt at your disposal. I'd say he was blessed. He gave him his royal clothes, fine linens. He had the best garments of anybody in all of Egypt. He was just in prison a second ago, and now he's wearing Armani. If that's still a brand name, I don't know. Saks Fifth Avenue. He gave him a gold chain. What was that? He was identified everywhere he went that he was under the protection of the Pharaoh, you better not touch this man. And he changed his name. How many of you got a name change? I sure did. I got to take on his name. <laughs> now this is significant. 
Verse 45. Go to verse 45. Somebody want to try to pronounce that name for me? <laughs> Zaphnath Panani. Just best we can do. Let's, I like it. We're going to call him Z. So his, his Hebrew name is Joseph, which means increaser. We talked about that last week when he was born of Rachel. His name means to increase or to add to. But now his Egyptian name <laughs> means Savior of the world. Now, why would his name be Savior of the world? Now, this is not after all that he did for Pharaoh in Egypt. This is before, as soon as he interprets the dream to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh puts him second in command of all of Egypt, then he gives him power to all the finances, he gives him final clothes to wear, wear royal uh, authority, and then he says, now at those seven years of tremendous harvest and crops, he gave, God gave Joseph the wisdom how to store all that up, so that when the seven years of famine came, literally, not just biblically, but historically, that you can trace it back to Joseph saving the known world at that time for, for storing up all the harvest of the seven years of plenty. So prior to all that, Pharaoh becomes a mouthpiece of God and prophesies that Joseph will be the savior of the world. Now, he was not the savior of the world as Christ is the savior of the world, but it is a type and shadow of Christ who was the savior of the world. He saved the world from a famine. Christ saved the world from death, sin and death through his sacrifice. So it, it, it's significant. So from pit to Potiphar to prison to Pharaoh's palace. In the pit, listen, the Lord was with Joseph. In Potiphar's house, when he's being falsely accused, the Lord was with Joseph. In the prison, when <laughs> the prison is the place of forgottenness. He was being forgotten. The pit is the place of rejection. His brothers rejected him and threw him in a pit. People get in a pit all the time. They're feeling rejected. But when you know that the Lord is with you, you won't feel that rejection. Potiphar's house is the place of false allegations. The accuser of the brethren that will come in. A lot of times, the church, brothers and sisters, will get into Potiphar's house. Now, when you're in Potiphar's house, it's not anything that you've done. It's the false accusation of the accuser that will get you in that place. And then the, the enemy will try to put you in a prison. That's the forgotten place. You, and here's what you do. Well, the Lord, hadn't, he, the Lord forgot me. I'm not doing this or I don't have that. Or I don't, that's the forgotten place. And when you're in the forgotten place, but Joseph remembered even in the, pot, in the forgotten place, the Lord is with me. Amen. And in the palace, the Lord was with Joseph. That's the place of prestige and promotion and prominence the place of influence and impact, and the Lord was still with him. So from the pit of the palace, one thing remained the same. The Lord was with Joseph, and he showed him favor and grace. Joseph walked in favor. One of the things that we have to realize is that Joseph walked in favor, and because he walked in the favor of God, he walked in forgiveness. You know, Forgiveness first has to come, and it has, and we have to receive that forgiveness from the Lord. So we're not under, He won't forgive us if I don't forgive you. So that's, that's, that's a false doctrine. That's an old covenant mentality that puts the work on you. That, Ed, if you don't forgive me, then God's not going to forgive you. No. Because God has forgiven you, you know how to forgive me. But I'm going to tell you right now where I believe most people that I encounter are right now with forgiveness. Not all, but most. If you 
rightly divide the word and you can explain so easy a, a child can understand it that God's forgiven them through what Jesus did. And they can accept that. And most will begin to understand with proper teaching and explanation of the word that because they're forgiven, now they have the ability to forgive others. Most people will say it. But here's where most people are that I've encountered personally. They can't forgive themselves. God has forgiven them, and you can sit there and talk to them. And they'll say, yeah. And after some proper teaching and training, and after a while, they'll get to the point that they understand, because God has forgiven me, I know how to forgive others. Now, even the ones that have hurt me the worst. But when you talk to most people, they get to the place in their life and they're in such a battle and the struggle comes from because they can't forgive themselves. Now let me tell you something. If God Almighty in heaven that knows every single inch of our heart and our desires and our intent loves us and will forgive us, let it go and forgive yourself. You say, well that's harder, that's easier said than done. No, just do it. For, forgive yourself. Quit. See what that's the that's an allegation, that's an accusation from the enemy. And what does he do? He lies. Why is he lying? He's trying to steal your identity from you, and he will try to keep you walking outside of that garment of grace that God's given you to walk in because he can't steal it. He can't take it away from you. So if he can't take it away from you and he can't steal it, what's he going to try to do to you? He's going to try to get you to not believe that it's rightfully yours, that you can't have it, that you don't deserve it, that you don't earn it. Yeah, that's why it's called a garment of grace. You don't deserve it. But I am worthy of it because he gave it to me, purchased it, bought it for me with his blood. The Hebrew says it. If your heart condemns you, your own heart will condemn you. And you won't forgive yourself. God's greater than your heart. The first coat his dad gave him as you stand to your feet. And his brother stole it. His second coat someone gave him and Potiphar's wife took it. When he got to prison, he was given an inmate garment and it was taken when he left prison to go to the palace. Pharaoh dressed him in fine linens. Only the king could give them to him. And there wasn't anybody that could take him away from him. Our robes of righteousness were given to us by the king. No man gave them to him, so no man can steal them from me. I can't be falsely accused that they're not really mine, and I'm not in any prison that would condemn me as a prisoner. I've got royal linens, because I am a king and a priest. So remember, Joseph was... Protected by the Lord's favor, he was promoted through the Lord's favor, favor, and he was made prosperous by the Lord's favor, and God promoted him. And that's the plan God has for you. Amen. And his garments of grace, his coat of favor, is on you, covering you. It's a covering. The word anointing means to be painted. And every single one of us are anointed with his favor. What does that mean? He's painted his favor all over you. And you're covered with it. And I believe that it's many colors. Lisa, what was that that you were telling me downstairs? About many or manifold. I'm... Yes. Okay. God, the, the angels go around the throne. They encircle God and they cry out, Holy, holy, holy. And what they're, every time they pass the throne, they've never stopped saying holy because every time they circle the throne, they see another aspect of God. There are colors in God that we've never seen. There's aspects of God that we've never seen. He's manifold. He's multifaceted. And I believe that's evident in His body. There's many colors, there's many gifts, there's many favors on us. And so all together, we're lovely. Together we're better, together we're stronger. Quit trying to do it on your own. Amen.
just bow your heads for just a moment. And contemplate the words that you've heard tonight. And maybe you're struggling with that, dealing with that unforgiveness of, to your, about yourself. You've never been able to quite forgive yourself for something you said, something that you did, or even the lie that you've bought into. If, you, if that's you, if you're in that arena, in that area of dealing with and trying to overcome unforgiveness to yourself, would you just put your hand up and put it right back down? And as you provided forgiveness, Hank, if you can find a song back there and just play a CD, that would be great. That Terry McGollum CD right now would be good. That he's provided forgiveness for you for all of your sins, past, present, and future. All done away with at the cross. John the Baptist said on the banks of the Jordan River, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when Jesus said it is finished and yielded up his spirit, every sin was taken away. It's a gift. And what you have to do is receive that gift. So if it's good enough for him to do for you, and it's good enough for you to do in forgiving others, then it's good enough for you to do for yourself. So it's good enough for you to forgive your, for yourself. Where, where unforgiveness comes in your heart towards yourself is buying into the lie. And if the enemy can get us to buy into the lie, then he'll swindle us out of anything. Your identity is found in Christ. So anything and everything that God intended for Jesus is available to you and if he would look at Jesus and say this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased then he'll look at you tonight and he'll say you are my son and my daughter in whom I'm well pleased now if you've not accepted Christ then the first thing that you need to do to forgive yourself is to accept the forgiveness that he's offered to you for your sins but if you have then don't buy into the lie of the enemy. Amen. Would you join hands with someone near you if you feel comfortable with that? Some of us raised our hands tonight, and as I looked over the congregation, it's the same sentiment has been true. What I've experienced with others is we're dealing with unforgiveness for ourselves. So just ask the Lord as He helps your brothers and sisters to forgive themselves. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood that's not lost its power, that still heals and saves and delivers, sets free, and brings forgiveness. Father, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice right now that as we receive forgiveness from you, we offer forgiveness to others and we accept forgiveness of ourselves and for ourselves tonight. And we give you praise and honor and thanksgiving for what you've done in our lives and what you're doing in our lives. Because he who has begun a good work in you, here's the word, he's faithful to complete it. You may drop those hands and lift them and just honoring the Lord tonight and blessing him with the fruit of our lips. We offer up praise and glory and honor and thanksgiving. To the one who is, who is, and who is to come, we bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We praise you, Jesus, the great I Am, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We bless you, Father, in Jesus' name. Would you just put your hands together and bless him tonight? Thank you, Father. We sure love you.